All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, we will. I think we can go ahead and get started. There will be some folks that will that are still coming in, but um, we want to maximize the amount of time that we have uh, available to um, talk about Fort today. I'm very excited. Hi, everyone. My name is Crystal Selton Pohl, um, and uh, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, the Framework for Open and Reproducible Research Training. Um, this is a project that is working to integrate open and reproducible science into higher education. Um, so this um, you're going to hear about a lot of really awesome projects today that work to um, advance research transparency, reproducibility, rigor and ethics uh, through pedagogical reform and uh, meta scientific research. Um, this this team provides um, some infrastructure and didactic resources that are uh, designed to recognize and support the teaching and the mentoring of open and reproducible science. Um, I'm going to hand uh, things over to Flavio to get us started. Um, if you have any questions during the course of, of this um, webinar, I'll be helping to facilitate that during the question and answer portion afterwards. So feel free to either use the Q&A option that's at the bottom of the screen um, or to use the chat. Um, and um, I'll be happy to help facilitate that um, after the presentations. But you're going to hear about a number of really awesome initiatives that are that are being done by Fort. So um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it along. All right, everybody. Um, so I hope everybody can hear me and see me. Yes. Um, um, so on behalf of the Ford community, I'm delighted to be here today and to have the opportunity to introduce you to Ford and its many incredible projects and team leads that are uh, present here. Um, I would also like to thank the COS, the Center for Open Science, and the organizers of this amazing uh, series of uh, workshops um, and webinars, and also in particular, the brilliant Kristen Stintopol and Katie Corker for having facilitated this event. Um, we uh, will be presenting a series of four projects, uh, which collectively aims to show how big team science can and should be applied uh, to open educational resources and meta science, and how um, we have built, we think, a sustainable, uh, a sustainable community uh, uh, that aims to integrate open science uh, into higher education and into teaching and research pipelines uh, through pedagogical communities. Um, um, so let's start from the beginning. What is the problem that uh, we, um, the collective of Fort, is trying to solve? So we think that as the wave of scientific reforms uh, changes the way that we uh, conceive of research practices and norms globally, um, higher education uh, has been left behind. And while academics are adopting best practices uh, uh, and higher standards, for, high standards for research quality and uh, accessibility of research outputs, we're still failing to address how we teach, how we mentor and supervise through open science. Um, so it's very uh, common that people go through their undergraduate and graduate studies without ever hearing about open science and uh, uh, new and better methodologies, research integrity, robustness, and all of that. Uh, so this has the consequence that it undermines permanently to, to, to sustainably redress the perverse academic incentives. Uh, but it also, uh, we think, detrimentally affects how research evaluations are, are, are conducted uh, which erode research quality. So to address all of these issues, we funded FORT. So what is it, what, what is FORT? <laughs> it's an organization that started five years ago. We just had our fifth birthday. It was um, uh, started at a hackathon at the Society for Improvement of Psychological Science by a psychologist and a political scientist, um, so social sciences in that way. 
but ever since we sort of expanded to several other uh, fields of inquiry and disciplines. Um, now we count with almost 900 folks, uh, mostly early career researchers and uh, um, about engage 500 people in, in at any given year on our projects. Our website is visited quite often. We have some uh, nice presence in social media and partnerships with major uh, uh, open science organizations. And thankfully our impact has been showcased at COS here, but also at the UKRN, UK Real, uh, UNESCO, the UK Parliament and NASA. So what are the four main goals? So the the first one is to build together with educators a path towards the incremental, so step-by-step -step, adoption of uh, teaching and mentoring practices that, uh, to, that teaches and mentors together with open science. We want to educate our students in the respective uh, topics, but also prepare them to be good consumers of science after they leave the education, the higher education, right? Um, Forso, Ford also aims to generate a conversation about the ethics and social impact of education that is focused on openness, uh, on epistemic uncertainty, epistemic plurality, uh, as well as research integrity, robustness, and credibility. We also try to respond to, uh, Ford tries to respond to calls to consider open science as inclusive open science, right? So try to uh, build ever uh, larger bridges and, and an umbrella for folks to be welcomed in. Um, and finally, Ford tries to promote discussions on the perceived importance of different academic activities. So for example, how publishing a paper is considered uh, um, much more, between quotes, important than um, providing educational resources or doing great teaching. So we advocate for greater institutional recognition of uh, uh, producing educational resources and quality teaching. Um, because we're presenting on COS, uh, uh, probably a lot of people is familiar with the uh, Center for Open Science uh, Goals Towards Scientific Utopia, um, which states that we need three main pillars to achieve our Shangri-La of open science. How can we best do our science, which is uh, opening scientific communication, restructuring that, those nefarious incentives to promote better practices, and crowdsource science to promote large-scale collaborations to accelerate scientific knowledge, but also accumulate science. And we suggest essentially there is a fourth principle to steer open scholarship towards that, that utopia that is just familiarizing students, the future consumers of science, but also the practitioners, the, 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 the people who will do science with the intricacies of open scholarship. So in that effort, uh, uh, we founded Fort and uh, those I, I will now present, uh, folks will now present the, the projects that they have been working uh, towards to achieve these goals. So I pass on to Elena Hartman, who will talk to you about uh, reversals. Thank you, Flavio. Okay. Hey. Um, yes, I want to present the replications and reversals in the social cognitive and behavioral sciences project that we are doing at Fort. Um, just a little bit of a background about the problem we're trying to address in this project. Um, so we know that replications of previous scientific work are at the core of, open, of the open scholarship movement, and they should be systematically highlighted in daily research practice. Um, but it can actually be very challenging for both researchers and educators who are teaching them maybe the next generation of researchers to stay up to date with certain effects in or outside their field, whether they replicate or whether they don't. Uh, furthermore, um, so-called reversal effects, um, where the effect uh, in the replication is opposed, so reversed compared to the original study, those are quite scattered in the literature and they are not really incorporated into research training or student education yet. So, for example, if you think of famous psychological experiments like the Milgram experiment, but also maybe some effects you have never heard of, the Big Brother effect, the Playboy effect, the so-called power posing or the marshmallow experiment, uh, many more of those, 
we, we can't actually quantify um, as of now how much replication evidence there is for each of these. Uh, at least it would take us uh, quite a um, amount of time to search for um, all the replications that have been done. So uh, Ford is here to alleviate that problem. Uh, we are now building a living crowdsourced curated list of replicated, non-replicated or reversed effects in empirical research across all domains of social, cognitive and behavioral sciences. We want to show in an exhaustive way what evidence for or against a certain effect exists so far. And we include metrics such as effect sizes, sample size, number of citations and so on. With this, we want to give educators and scholars a valuable tool so they can keep up to date with prevalent effects in and outside their fields, and they can use those in their students' replication projects, for example, when deciding which effects to investigate in a project with students. Here you see an overview of the resource. Uh, we have a huge spreadsheet with all the effects, uh, one row per effect, and um, we have a few uh, uh, things to remember what the effects are doing. We have subterms, we, ha we categorize them into disciplines. And of course, we also uh, note down the contributors to each of these effects. Um, this is what an effect looks like in our Google Doc and also on our website where we constantly update uh, in, in new incoming effects that are added. Um, and you can see that we assign a status that is obviously changing depending on when new studies are added and the, the overall evidence changes. Um, we cite the original paper with some metrics and then all the critiques. So all the studies, meta-analysis reviews who have kind of uh, tried to find the same effect again. And then we list effect sizes. Um, we're currently in a phase where we're trying to expand the resource um, that is planned until the end of this year. And we are already uh, drafting our first output piece for this, um, for this project. Uh, we're also working on uh, developing two our shiny apps that will further um, help educators to use our resource. So one will be called Replicability Annotator, and here you will be able to upload reference lists and identify replicated studies and their status. Um, this is in partnership with the Replication Database and uh, Lukas Rösele and Lukas Weilrich. The other app, the Replication Explorer, will allow you to explore and visualize replication effects, as you can see here in this mock-up, um, and will allow for investigation of meta-scientific questions using the effect sizes that we note down. Um, so to sum it up, we have currently already over 470 effects spanning 22 disciplines. We're constantly adding more. And uh, the Ford website is regularly updated to reflect this growing of the resource. Um, the good news is um, we also applied to the Dutch Research Foundation Open Science Fund, and our fingers are crossed that we get further funding to continue with this project, especially the development of the apps. Um, and the good news for you is the work is still very much ongoing, and new people are invited to join the project and contribute with entries. Um, since we have a manuscript in progress, um, which will be about reconceptualizing the many reasons why replications can fail, um, we'll also need feedback at some point. So these are two ways that you could contribute to the project. And uh, this just leaves me with saying that, of course, it's not a one person doing this, but it's me coordinating everything and a lot of project managers and a lot of contributors um, helping out with this huge project. Um, so yeah, that just leaves me to thank you for your attention and I will hand it over. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, my name is Sam Parsons. I'm always excited to talk anything thoughts. Um, and it's my pleasure to be representing the community behind the thoughts glossary project today. And of course, thank you to Center for Open Science for ho hosting the webinar. Um, really excited to share the project and um, hopefully have some of you join us. So without further ado, the Thoughts Glossary project um, is very much an effort to bring together a um, community approach to crowdsource and come to a general consensus on a number of terms uh, terminology and sort of 
definitions, descriptions of the kind of language that we use day to day in our conversations around open science and open scholarship. Um, however, a lot of this language can be uninterpretable, can be a barrier of itself to those that are newcomers. And that's one of the things that we wanted to support and address. I'll have the link uh, at the bottom of each of these slides to the glossary page on the website. Please do follow it. This will become more important later when I try and uh, get you involved uh, for the for the project. It's important to note there are many, many people behind this behind this project. We had over 100 uh, contributors and co-authors um, on our paper to share the, the glossary project. Um, and we're wel welcoming to anyone and everyone that wants to support this effort. Okay. Now, the goals behind phase one in particular were roughly threefold. So we wanted to reduce the barriers, as I said, to enter these discussions. One of the other aims was to kind of broaden the terminology used. Often we talk about kind of quote unquote open science, and that can be somewhat limiting. It can be very STEM focused um, and it can be very exclusive towards, for example, um, the, the, the social sciences and humanities. So really opening up that approach was part of the aim. Now, not only in terms of broadening the kind of field specific um, focus, but also to fully reflect the open in open scholarship. So therefore, there are uh, a good number of um, diversity, equity, inclusivity terms, um, and a lot of um, definitions and descriptions around social justice concepts that are incorporated in this, um, because they are really essential, I think, to, to the mission behind open scholarship and thought. And thirdly, to provide a, a resource for students, for instructors to, again, reduce these barriers, make things easier to enter into these discussions. Now, phase one has been a fair success. Um, to give you a quick overview of the website itself, um, the glossary project, you can find it on the Fort website. We have a bunch of terms down the side. Um, uh, somewhere in the 300-ish, I think, is live on the website, um, if not more. We have some basic information about the um, terms, but to give you an example um, of one of my favorite ones, um, an open peer review. Now, this is one of those terms that can be used in several different ways and often is itself leading to confusion in the discussions. If one means sharing the review materials versus signing reviews, now that will lead us down very different discussions and it's really easy to talk past each other. So having that kind of information is exceedingly useful in my opinion. Now, in phase two, we're interested in expanding the glossary um, to include more terms, um, more, uh, more, more descriptions that will be useful to kind of expand the reach, um, as well as improving and correcting any any terms that may be in there that could be better. Perhaps most excitingly, to expand the accessibility um, and kind of interoperability of the glossary, we have a number of teams that are working on translating um, the glossary, or at least sections of the glossary, into um, other languages so that we are trying to be a bit less, um, we're trying to increase the, the, the potential for diversity and, and accessibility, essentially. Um, now these teams are in progress. We have them on our Slack channel. You can find them by joining that, um, as I'm sure you'll get a lot of information uh, saying join our join our Slack channel um, throughout today. Please go there, um, follow the glossary. If you're interested in seeing or using these translations, follow the documentation and it will all be there. Now this leads us to the, the plan of action for this kind of phase two. In my ideal world, um, let's say somewhere before the start of the next academic year, it'd be really nice to have a couple of these translations live on the website. And it would be amazing if by the end of the year, we can update the glossary so that we have the kind of 2.0 version with all of the additional terms and a bunch more translations. That's kind of my 
uh, my ideal world situation. And of course, if you join us, that can become much, much more of a reality. And it would be amazing to have you on board. To give a quick overview on the web page itself, on the glossary page, as you can see, all you need to do is scroll down, hit phase two of the glossary. The document itself has all of the information you could possibly need to get involved in the project. Follow that, join us, ask any questions on the Slack. Um, it's a very welcoming group that are involved. We'd love to have you. Um, and thank you. Love to have you involved. Thank you very much. Um, thanks again to Open Science and the rest of the Forts community for this. Speak soon. Okay, hopefully everybody can hear and see me. Thanks for that. That was amazing. Um, so I'm going to continue the uh, passion for all things uh, open scholarship. Uh, my name's Tom, it's he, him. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about the Fort Summaries project. So another very exciting development. And I guess the issue that, that that's promoted this project is the fact that we're all very busy people. And uh, it's increasingly hard to keep up with what on earth open scholarship is doing. Um, Twitter every day seems to have a, a different um, controversial take on all sorts of practices. But also we've revised so many of the things that we thought were well established and um, assumed to be the norm. We're changing these all the time. And so we have a job as, as academics, as educators, as researchers to try and keep up with this. And that is, that's a pretty big challenge. So the point of this is to try and find a way to ensure that people can keep up to date with the open scholarship literature and then subsequently be able to use those practices, those ideas to inform what they're doing. And this is where the summary project comes up. So the aim here is to digest the literature and hopefully just facilitate people's understanding and adoption of, of open scholarship practices. So it is, uh, as you might uh, have already suggestedly uh, guessed, we like a good spreadsheet and we like a big document. Um, and here we've got over 200 uh, attempts to summarize various papers, blog posts, sources of information or evidence on open scholarship. So this includes everything from opinion articles, empirical articles, literature reviews. And this is an example. Uh, you can obviously see them whenever you wish, fort.org slash summaries. And you can see, in addition to providing some basic information, including things like the abstract, how you might cite the paper, it also includes a summary of all the core details of the paper. So you can see under main takeaways, there's a few bullet points trying to summarize the article. There's some interesting quotes. We also do lots of signposting. So in this case, the first thing you might see is um, it signposts you to some other papers on similar themes you might find interesting. And again, this is a, an attempt to try and encourage people's incremental growth and understanding in open scholarship. What we do beyond that is we also map these summaries onto what's known as the Ford clusters, um, which I'm sure uh, Flavio can uh, tell you a little bit more later about. But in essence, what we try to do is group things that make sense together um, and then put these summaries tagged with these uh, clusters so we can easily negotiate the same or look for uh, papers covering the same sorts of issues. So, for example, if you're interested in replication research, you can see uh, this one. You can see talks about things like registered replication reports, large scale replication attempts, purposes of replication, etc. And so you can find these summaries categorized based upon uh, these clusters in an attempt, uh, not perfectly, but nothing really is perfectly fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, but uh, that is our attempt to, to help uh, people navigate and negotiate these. The one thing I really like about this project is that in addition to acknowledging that there is a lot of stuff on open scholarship that's hard to keep an eye on, there is also so much in what open scholarship does in relation to EDI, social justice, accessibility. And so what we have covered is not only papers solely about open scholarship, but also those that relate to diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. 
And so this is an opportunity to place these a little bit higher on people's awareness in the hope that we can promote some positive social movements. So you might think, gosh, that's a big effort. And it indeed has been. It's always a team effort we've fought. And for each summary, it's drafted by one person. It's independently reviewed by at least two other people uh, who then tend to make amendments, provide feedback. And then it's uh, categorised. I think I've categorised a few hundred, it feels like, of these um, according to fault clusters so you can uh, track them. And what we really need is you. Um, we would love for you to get involved with team summaries. So uh, revising existing summaries is really important to ensure we're really capturing what the, the true essence of the papers are. Um, also with categorising summaries. And we are working on a few things in the distance that we'd like you to keep a, uh, an eye on. So we're putting together a paper describing the OS summaries, trying to uh, encourage people to use and engage with them. And we're creating a strategy for how we can more widely disseminate these um, exciting, exciting overviews. So that is it for thought summaries. Um, a really, really interesting project. And I hope uh, I'll see some of you on the call today joining us uh, to uh, chip in and join. Um, so I'll hand over to the next amazing project. Um, and that's led by uh, Magda, who's going to be talking about neurodiversity. Over to you. Thank you, Tom. Okay, so my name is Magdalena Grose Hodge, and I'm going to tell you a few words about the work we do within Team Neurodiversity. So just very briefly, neurodiversity refers to the naturally occurring, so non-pathological variation in the human brain regarding social, cognitive, and emotional functions. And some common examples of neurodivergence include dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism. So in our group, we have both uh, neurotypical and non-neurotypical members. Um, the group was founded in 2021 by Mahmoud, Tamara and Amalie. At the moment, we have around 70 members. Um, uh, not, member, not all members are active at the same time. Uh, most of us are uh, early career academics or students. We have a rotating leadership structure. And uh, some of the projects that I wanted to tell you about uh, that we have been uh, working on recently include uh, Neurodiversify Your Curriculum. This is the first one that I would like to talk about because I think it's the most topical here. So basically, Team Neurodiversity has developed 10 lessons, um, which include lesson plans and interactive materials. Uh, we have developed them thinking about psychology students, but they can really be used by any students and lecturers in higher education because they focus on developing academic skills and uh, research, um, research skills. So uh, we have done this to promote open scholarship and neurodiversity in academia and include um, uh, neurodiversity affirming pedagogies. We wanted to raise awareness of some of the most recent debates relating to science, invite students to engage in epistemological discussions and to reflect on the core values of open science. So to the left, you've got a screenshot of uh, what the research looks like and you can see um, uh, number of lesson, um, the lesson itself, as well as lesson plan that can be used by the lecturer. Uh, so this is an example, uh, a lesson which is on implicit bias and normative science. Here students are um, invited to uh, read a text and recognize implicit bias in the academic text, so to reflect on it a bit more critically. We then move on to uh, talking about deficit approaches and how they may stem from, um, from such language and invite students to think about the ablest language that is used in scientific publications, especially on neurodiversity. So the project aims at raising awareness and the pathologizing neurodiversity, uh, addressing the double empathy problem, uh, so the problems with communication between different neurotypes. It focuses on open science and participatory research methods and promotes universal design for learning in higher education. Um, I am just very quickly going to go through uh, some other projects that we're working on at the moment. Um, some of the main ones are database of neurodivergent researchers, 
So we invite um, academics who uh, represent um, non-typical um, um, non um, neurotypes um, to become part of our database in order to promote neurodivergent researchers in the academia and role models for students. We also have Academic Wheel of Privilege, which is going to be in the moment uh, presented by Sarah. We also pre pre present a neurodiversity reading list, which is a starting point for anyone who would like to learn more about uh, neurodiversity. We have written a position statement where we explain how important embracing neurodiversity in open scholarship is. And we look at uh, experience of ADHDers and other uh, neurotypes in the academia. Finally, we look at uh, ableism and challenging it, and we do that by uh, promoting participatory approaches and look at open scholarship and autism research. The last part is thinking about education, uh, thinking about how we assess students um, and how we could make our assessment more inclusive, uh, as well as look at open scholarship and autism education. So anyone can join us, um, irrespectively of their neurotype, um, and we have quite a few projects that we're working on at the moment. So there is uh, plenty of uh, scope for uh, plenty of help needed. So I, I do invite you to come and talk to us. Um, and this is it from me. Sarah is going to tell you more about one of our team neurodiversity projects, uh, which is Wheel of Privilege. Uh, thank you. Is that working? Okay. Um, so yeah, so I'm Sarah, I'm one of the co-leads for the Academic Wheel of Privilege, and I'm going to be um, sharing the backgrounds, developments, how you can get involved, and wait till the end because there's a little challenge for you to take away. Um, I've color-coded each section so it's like clear which section I'm speaking about. The plant references are because I'm a plant scientist, and I love plants. Um, so... Um, the academic will privilege the origins are from our position statement from Team Neurodiversity, which was about neurodiversity and open scholarship. And we were having authorship discussions sort of throughout the project. And then towards the end, we were wrapping up things for like, how do we um, organize the, the authorship order to make it sort of equitable? And we had in mind how with authorship, it's a key uh, determinant of academic career progression from the number of publications, citations, excuse me, um, authorship positions, and they all heavily influence the career trajectories. And it has influence on hiring, funding, networking opportunities, and even who we celebrate. So we have that in mind. And also like the wider context of academia that it's not a meritocracy. I've just put here a bunch of um, academic articles talking about the barriers faced by scholars in academia. Um, so with those two things in mind, we co-created the Academic Wheel of Privilege, and this is the first version of it, which you can find in our preprint, and we have seven broad categories um, and identities and experiences which are relevant to academia, and they're based on published evidence, expertise, our personal experiences, and public consultation. And in the position statement, um, we use this um, as a way to, so we decided that all the authors would be joint authors, and then we used this wheel of privilege to determine the author list. So we used a scoring system where there's more privilege as you go towards the center. So there's three um, levels, and then we summed our scores, and we also weighted each of the identity categories equally. And then we used those scores to then um, decide on the authorship order. And that was a really interesting, deep, reflective exercise for us. Um, and these are just some of the sort of things that we discussed as authors um, from the authorship team. And um, someone said, oh, this could be actually pretty big. 
um, because it was actually a supplementary figure uh, in in this position statement, but it went sort of semi-viral on Twitter and LinkedIn, and it's been used as a resource at the UK Research Integrity Office, local councils. Um, and then we were like, oh, I think actually this could be its own project. Um, so that's the that's where it sort of comes from. And we're also sort of looking at the time, like, what is out there? What current authorship frameworks are there? And we're all very familiar with um, credit. There's other ones. There's a new one with, like, merit. Um, and there's different sort of frameworks about authorship, order, and just generally authorship. But these... Um, frameworks, while they're good at sort of building transparency and, and have proved sort of useful, this, um, these authorship policies do not embed justice, equity, uh, diversity and inclusion. So this is where the academic world of privilege comes in, and I would summarise it as a holistic equity-based authorship framework to examine social position in academia. And there's sort of three strands to it. It's um, intersectional in the sense that we uh, look at many different types of social cultural identities. It's operationalized through using a shiny app, which is um, led, this effort is led by Beth and Eileen. And we also have a, an important part, which is about that it's reflexive, that so you think about um, the process of doing using this framework and um, thinking about your sort of social position and what that means. Um, within yourself and also with the team that you work with. So in terms of developing the framework, we took on board a lot of the feedback from social media, emails and various things. Um, and then we've developed the Shiny app, um, which makes it easier than just sort of looking at the figure and deciding um, where the Shiny app allows um, users to customize the different um, identities. Um, we'll have weightings, you can remove categories, add them and find out more about the categories. Um, but also creating a user guide to help um, navigate this process. And then we also have some educational materials um, through a syllabus to extend this learning on these topics. So the current stage, we are finalizing the manuscripts and the syllabus and the Shiny app, and we hope to preprint soon. I won't give a definite date when, but it'll be soon, so have your eyes peeled. Um, and in terms of sort of next steps, and once the preprint is out, like um, those of you who are watching, how you can get involved, we'd love for you to try it out, um, reflect on the process, how, what things you found um, challenging, or you know those sort of um, things, the process, and then also explore the educational materials that we provide, uh, which will be in the supplementary. Also, we love, love, love feedback. So um, sending us. Um, questions or things that you found um, easy, hard, challenging, inaccessible, accessible, etc. We'd, we'd love to hear feedback. We'd also love for you to share it within your networks, on social media, with your colleagues, and also um, to discuss it within your academic um, sphere of influence with your colleagues, if you're an editor, whatever sort of academic position that you have. And we also um, are keen to get support for um, the, the syllabus and to extend um, these educational materials and crowdsource um, to further um, extend the learning. And also we'd love for you to um, join our Slack channel for this project and details will be in the next slide. And now the challenge um, is to find 20 minutes this week, um, reflect on your social location and academia. So using the, the wheel of privilege, and you can access it by this QR code. And then to ask yourself the question, which areas do I hold the most privilege? And how does that make me feel? And with that, I will stop there. And I'll go on to, um, it'll be Julia Wolska, who will talk about landscapes. Okay, thank you for listening to my presentation about mapping the landscape of open scholarship literature across disciplines. Um, now I just need to find out how to...
Sorry. Um, so the contents of this presentation are to talk a bit about the project motivation first and the project aims, and then talk about the project plan and the community efforts. So the motivation for this project was because there's a problem of a solitary and fragmented nature of research. And often we don't really know what for other research is published in um, our field or like open science, open scholarship generally doesn't necessarily have to be in our field. And then there are information barriers that hinder the progress of science and also how to develop and make our own science better. So um, basically that leads to the problem of reinventing the wheel and to a waste of resources. Um, so there might be also some biased or misleading knowledge um, and um, there might be some lack of empirical evidence on consensus, but also on um, the disagreement, what might um, be open scholarship and what might not be classified as open scholarship. And then we've probably all heard of the jingle jungle fallacy so that uh, two things that are actually different are considered as being the same or otherwise that two things that are being the same are considered as being different. So the aims of this project, a project were to create and curate a database of literature about open scholarship across different disciplines. So I, I think it's probably fair to say that most people from the Ford community are psychologists, but not all of them are. Some people are in different disciplines and open science and open scholarship exists across different disciplines in science um, and also in fields that might not be traditionally viewed as science. And by uh, creating this database, we then hope this will allow for an easy and customizable um, query. Um, so in the project, we review and synthesize the literature um, that exists to map um, the landscape of this literature. So we aim to reveal the current consensus and also the disagreement, and then hope to inform future efforts and discussions and we hope this will facilitate interdisciplinary knowledge exchange and collaboration because um, we can learn about open scholarship and, um, when reading literature in our own discipline, but also when reading about something in different disciplines. Um, so this is basically the project plan. Um, so we aim to build a database and then review the literature. Um, so we are almost at the end of phase one now. And in this phase, we built the base literature using a web of science as a search tool and then perform some bibliometric analysis to synthesize this literature. And um, this phase is then our initial step towards building an interdisciplinary database of open scholarship literature and to map the landscape of this literature. Um, and then depending on the results of this um, analysis, we may then follow up with an in-depth narrative um, review and other complementary analysis. Um, so this is basically the plan for phase one, and uh, we are almost at the end of the screening, and um, then we will move on to phase two afterwards, where we will um, then look for some um, disagreement, because basically there are always um, two screeners uh, for each article, and maybe, yeah, so if I move on to the slide, um, so basically, there are some uh, screener names, whoever screens the, the articles, then they put in their email and um, their affiliation, and they have some uh, screener IDs, which are odd or even in different um, colors. And um, basically, um, then they blind code, um, blind screen, the different um, articles. And um, so we look whether two screeners agree on one article or not. And uh, we have identified more than 2000 articles and um, people, but 
it's not um, clear whether all of those articles will be included in um, the final um, output or not, because um, people look at these articles, they look at the keywords and um, the abstract, and if necessary, they can look at the full text, and then they see whether um, the article deals with open science, open scholarship enough to be included or excluded. So basically people say include, exclude, or uncertain. And particularly when they say uncertain, then they can make some notes and say why they are uncertain. And um, if there's like some disagreement, if one screener would include an article and the other one would exclude it, then in the second phase where we will move on to soon now, um, then some um, other independent screener will then make a final decision. And um, yeah, so basically we are almost at the end of um, the phase one, but moving on to phase two soon and um, always look for people who are happy to be involved. And um, yeah, obviously I also didn't do the project um, on my own. There are some other um, community um, project managers involved. Um, so I would like to thank them and um, yeah, and also thank all the people who already screened the articles. And if you want to join us and stay updated, then as been as has been mentioned in the presentations before, you can join for Slack and our uh, channel is called Team Literature Landscape. And you can uh, screen as many or as little articles as you want. And um, yeah, so there are some um, credits for um, to be considered to be an author, but um, yeah, we can talk about this in more detail if you want to. So yeah, thank you for listening. And um, I will hand over to Max now. Okay, thanks. Right. So I'm I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a paper we we recently um, finished and which got just accepted, and this is about. Uh, the positive changes which, which came with the replication crisis. Um, and just to come back a little bit to my experience as a student, there was a bit um, like a rabbit hole which I dived down when, when learning about the replication crisis. And I was quite interested in this, so it was not a problem for me. I, I really liked the topic and um, I, was, I was digging down reading and listening to podcasts and really engaging with the topic because I, I knew this was important and um, this, yeah, and uh, but I guess this is not the same for all for all people, and um, it might especially be a little bit discouraging for some people um, hearing about all the things that have gone wrong in 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 a field. And at the same time, of course, outlining errors is is really important, maybe one of the most important things. And um, but I think in the next step we need to learn from our past mistakes. So so this is why. I thought, um, yes, those positive changes that have actually happened in the recent years um, within the context of the replication crisis need to be acknowledged and um, also encouraged. Um, and then um, we need to build upon those. So, and just to underline this, this one point a little bit, most um, that, that the focus was a lot on, on those, um, um, on, on outlining the problem. So here are two of the probably most cited papers within the context of the replication crisis. And you see an incredible and, and numbers of, of citations and those, yes, they outline uh, the problem. And now it would be great to move towards solving the problem, right? And um, Samin Vizier has already um, coined a, a great term for this. Um, instead of like looking at the replication crisis as this crisis, she said that it would probably be better understood as a credibility revolution, so something we can um, see as an opportunity to change. Um, and uh, those key points of the re uh, credibility revolution are um, that there's a greater emphasis now on transparency and openness, pre-registrations and uh, direct replication studies, but also that there are generally higher um, standards for the quality 
and uh, I guess also to some degree the quantity of evidence needed um, to to make some claims. So, <clears throat> so in other words, there is already change happening. So that because this uh, term Simeon um, mentioned there is just not just an uh, in, in invention, but really describing a lot of the changes that have happened. But what is still or was still missing was a resource which was actually structuring and um, presenting the, the developments which are already there. And um, because it, it can be sort of cumbersome to, to dig through a lot of uh, literature, which is also not necessarily right away accessible, and to even just get, a, get an overview. So this is why we, we came up with a way of just structuring the changes which, which have happened. And um, there are some general trends we noticed. So um, there is an increased focus on um, working in teams, for example. So this is what we categorized as a community level change, just, just as thought. Um, there, are, there are many, many different procedural level changes, which each one of us can, can implement, mainly focusing on methods and statistical procedures, but also some uh, yeah, statistical tools. And then um, on the uh, structural level, there are a lot of uh, policies and incentives, which are, which are um, yeah, great, actually. So um, just to give a little overview of the paper now, um, so this, so again, it's, a, it's supposed to be a resource, which makes it easier to access this topic of the replication crisis and what to do with it. And it can hence, um, for example, be used by students or, or educators. Um, and we, we provide a short introduction to the replication crisis and then give an overview of all those changes I just mentioned that you see in the figure. And then we also give a little outlook of, of what, what can come next. Um, and so great, we have a, we have a paper, but uh, much more important is that it's actually being used. And um, so this is why we're now starting to prepare some educational resources. And um, so first we want to give a, or, or prepare a little short presentation, which can give an overview. So this can, for example, be used for, to present it at your initiative or your reproducibility uh, journal club. And, and then, um, when we're done with that, then we really want to move to um, to create syllabi or one syllabus at least um, to facilitate the teaching of, of a more positive or constructive view of the replication crisis, um, which will consist of a series of, of lectures and uh, come with slides and, and scripts. And uh, yeah, there's I, I will share the slides and then there's there's a link in it. And um, I'm sure I can share also this, the, the link for the to the paper. And this is all really in the beginning, so I would really appreciate anybody who could help us with this. Um, so please come and join us. Now we said a lot of times Slack is the, the place to be. And um, otherwise you can email me or Flavio or I, I guess. So yes, this was everything from my side. And I just wanna thank everybody who, who worked on this project, it was really, a fantastic effort and experience to to work in Ford, and I can only recommend it. And now I can hand it over to Leticia, uh, who is talking about uh, pedag pedagogies. Thank you, Max. So I'll uh, briefly introduce you to another Ford project, uh, which is uh, pedagogies. And as you hear heard uh, many times today already, like one of the major goals of Ford is to help uh, people or facilitate the process of scholars and integrating open scholarship into um, education and mentoring and in their own research. And we know uh, it's not an easy task to do. So what we try to do with pedagogies is that um, it should be, we, we, we want that facilitate the process that we actually learn from other people who are already doing an excellent job at this. So what we do at what pedagogy is, is a collection uh, of exemplary instances uh, of principal education in teaching or mentoring of open and reproducible principles. And principal education is basically education that combines the content of any course or of any discipline with open scholarship um, tenets or principles. And this can include a variety of things, right? It can be experiences of adapting courses to incorporate open scholarship principles 
reflections on increasing dissemination and recognition of open scholarship and, and teaching materials, or even perspectives on the social and ethical responsibilities um, that we have as educators of teaching open scholarship. Um, pedagogists have two very important elements to it. Uh, the first one is that um, every we actually contact uh, educators who are doing an excellent job into integrating open scholarship uh, into their mentoring, into their teaching, and uh, we uh, coordinate with them to share these materials. So basically, this is, uh, you can see here on the left uh, side of the screen, uh, a pedagogy that we did with um, Julie Strand on a course that she taught on credibility revolution and everything is open. So like we can easily access and incorporate or adapt into our own teaching. So the syllabus, the course materials, course technicals and et cetera. So this is the first important element. Everything is open. Uh, the second important element is the behind the scenes. So we actually conduct an interview um, with these educators to learn their experiences, how hard it was to, to do this, what were the experiences, what is the advice uh, to people trying to incorporate open scholarship into their teaching and mentoring, what was the perspective of students uh, learning uh, about open scholarship, and etc. The process of the pedagogist is all community driven. So we basically go onto our social media channels, Slack, Twitter, Mastodon, and we ask people, um, who um, do you think is, go is doing an amazing job in incorporating open scholarship into teaching and mentoring? We follow up on the suggestions, contact these um, scholars and educators in, var in varied fields. Um, and after we contact them, we announce that the next pedagogy will be with this person. And then again, we go back to the community and we ask the community for what would you like to learn from this person? What, which questions would you like us to ask them? And then we conduct, we, we connect with this uh, educator again, like to share their materials online on Ford's uh, website, but also to conduct an interview, as I mentioned, to learn from them all the behind the scenes process. And as the last step, we actually put everything as in the form of a blog post on uh, Ford's uh, website. So you can have like different sources, the interview uh, in text, in video, but also all the materials open there. You can check it out on Ford's uh, webpage, the, the pedagogist page. We have one pedagogy with Julie Strand on her, on her course on the credibility revolution, where she shared the insights, what the students thought about this course, um, how she set it up, and etc. Our second pedagogy is also extremely nice with Gilad Feldman on the variety of resources uh, open science resources that he has, and especially uh, his um, uh, replication efforts involving students uh, of his courses um, in, in doing replications. And coming soon, we uh, did a pedagogies with uh, the, the CREP, um, and we had Jordan Wagi and uh, two other students actually talking about their experiences in doing replications. And this will be coming soon, so um, yeah, uh, stay tuned. Now that you know about the project, I will quickly um, tell you, you might be wondering why does it matter, right? And we think it matters for three important reasons. First, as I mentioned, is uh, the aim is to facilitate the implementation of open scholarship into teaching and mentoring. So all resources are open and you can learn from people who are already experienced in doing that. And you can borrow their materials and you can uh, use and adapt to their materials. The second key compo component to the pedagogy is to encourage a change in the academic incentives structure and to highlight the educator, their educational method, but also to provide a citation format for everything that they are doing. And the third component is to foster ju uh, social justice and in the hopes that in the long term, we can encourage uh, the de democratization of uh, access to open education. Now, again, as in any project, we are always looking for collaborating for collaborators and you can help in a variety of ways. So you can help by suggesting educators in your own field uh, who we can invite to do a pedagogist with. Um, you can be active when we kind of share in, the, in our social media channels that we are doing the pedagogies with this next educator. You can uh, share with us the questions that you would like to ask this person. And of course, you can uh, also join uh, team pedagogies and you will be very much welcomed. We are a small team and I would like uh, to also thank these three people, Julia Voska, who is here, Georgia and Jacob, uh, who have been key in um, uh, helping with the last uh, three pedagogies. 
So thank you very much. And now I'll hand back to Flavio. All right, everybody. I hope you will um, see my screen soon. And um, I will start because we have like five minutes. I will be very quick, but essentially going through uh, a few initiatives at Fort that uh, we think you should know about. So we have the Fort lesson plans and essentially to support educators aiming to bridge that, you know, um, research to teaching gap. We thought, to we thought that it would be a good idea to produce lesson plans that everybody can use and can adapt to their own context, right? So we composed uh, nine evidence-based lesson plans. We are now updating our website uh, to 21 uh, total, and we also um, made a shorter lesson plan, so things between five minutes to 20 minutes that you can apply at any moment in your class that is sort of decontextualized in a way. Um, and now we are also updating it to 65 very soon. And we wrote an article to talk to you, to tell you about what are these lesson plans. So on the topics, thinking of uh, interpreting uh, uh, effect sizes, register reports, how to be critical, not cynical, understanding what dodgy papers are. But we also talked about qualitative research and diversity and inclusion and broken science. So you can see those uh, at our URL, uh, fort.org uh, uh, slash lesson plans, uh, and we are soon going to update. Another paper that we think you should know is that we made a review uh, that has been just published at the Royal Society for Open Science, uh, looking at the impact of teaching and mentoring open science on students, right? So we use a team science approach, so 75 collaborators worldwide, to review and synthesize evidence that investigates what happens to students when you teach about open science. So think we divide it into three clusters, so scientific literacy, so think of knowledge, skills, competencies, all that beautiful thing. Um, scientific engagement, which is enjoyment of learning, motivation, future behaviors with science, and attitudes toward science, which is just perceptions of science, trusting science, feeling towards particular practices. And if you want to know the results, it is published. Go see. It is very interesting, but essentially is that uh, we need more evidence, but there's some cool works in progress that we are aware of that we'll be able to uh, answer several questions. Um, we have this initiative called Fort Curated Resources, in which we pull together the knowledge of several members of our community. Um, everybody can contribute online as well. And we gathered almost 900 resources. So you go to fort slash, uh, dot org slash resources, and you can use this search bar here to search any full word. So about p-values, reproducibility, broken science, what is replicability, any, any sort of word, as long as it's whole, and we'll search resources for you. And what is really great is that we uh, collaborate with the Center for Open Science, and we are now together with the Open Scholarship Knowledge Base, putting it all together at this at this initi initiative, which increased our resources to about 30, 30 to 80, uh, 30 to 20 percent. But it only means that we are, you know, just trying to uh, increase redundancies and work together for your benefit. Um, there is also a Fort Glossary that uh, Sam Parsons couldn't be here today, but we have a video. So for those of you at home, you will see Fort's uh, uh, Glossary initiative um, uh, be edited in into this. But essentially, we devised a glossary for open reproducible research terms. So anyone can learn about what it is, these new words that we are developing. Um, this is how it looks on the website. There's phases, there's translations. We're expanding it as well. So please check it out that video. And we also uh, have the Fort Clusters, which uh, Tom talked about, which is essentially a summary of how you can conceive of uh, clustering or, or um, uh, understand uh, open science. And we are now partnering up with uh, Kuala Lab, with the, the Open Qualitative Research Lab, which um, will, uh, together with us, include a additional cluster on open science and qualitative research, uh, which is really, really cool. And we're going to also add research integrity cluster and uh, a few other things. We're just reimagining open science um, uh, with a lot of resources. So you can use it to compose your syllabi as well. 
um, because um, um, that's what the, the community uh, really thinks is the way forward. All right, with that, I'll let you be and uh, end this for today. I would like to thank everybody for their amazing presentations at Fort. I'd like to thank Kristen Stentel, Paul, Katie Corden, and COS for giving this amazing opportunity. We are also very happy. And I hope I didn't cross the, six, the one hour limit. I just wanna say thank you. I, I think we do have time for one question that hasn't been answered. Thanks for folks that have been popping into the Q&A. Um, just really quickly, um, somebody asked about the possibility of integrations into Zotero or other open Biblio tools. I don't know if Fort folks have talked about using Zotero at all for some of this work. We do have a Zotero Fort library where we put in the bibliography that we use in our papers. Um, but when it comes to integration um, um, of initiatives, not yet, but if this is something that could be super interesting and we are just lacking the expertise and, and people power to, to make this a reality. Awesome. Um, if there's, does some, is somebody able to quickly grab that Zotero link? possibly and pop it into the chat. It seems like there are a couple of folks that are interested in it. Um, otherwise, I think all of the questions um, have been answered either through the Q&A um, session or um, anything else. Folks, I've posted a couple of times the links to join the community um, and also the website and Twitter and stuff. So um, if folks have questions, they can contact anyone at, at Ford. Thank you all for coming.